Good morning, and, Good morning and welcome to the commencement ceremonies for the Goldman School of Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Welcome to the Goldman School faculty, <laughs> students, and staff who has, have a, as always, organized this so incredibly well. But of course, most of all, welcome to the family, friends, and graduating class of 2015. My name is Henry Brady, and it's my really great privilege to be the Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy. Today, we're here to honor, celebrate, and congratulate the Goldman School class of 2015. The class of 2015 has done great things at GSPP. They've achieved a number of firsts. They initiated the first staff appreciation luncheon to recognize the hard work of our tremendous staff. Thank you for doing that. Several of the members of the class of 2015 launched the school's first ever housing and urban policy student group, which was not just for students, but also for faculty and alumni and others who are interested in housing policy. And they had a great session just a few weeks ago, an inaugural event. Members, and thank you for that. Members of the class of 2015 helped to organize the largest and best attended Students of Color in Public Policy Annual Race and Policy Symposium. They celebrated five years. Go ahead. They celebrated five years of this wonderful event, and this year's keynote speaker was our Vice Chancellor, Claude Steele, who talked about stereotyping and implicit racism. A really great talk. Thank you for that, as I've said for each thing. <laughs> Members of the class of 2015 launched the first ever Advanced Policy Analysis Symposium, which showcased the extraordinary work that our students do. These are the topics that are listed in your program, all the amazing studies and works that have been done, providing tremendous help to pro uh, governments, to nonprofits, and others in the Bay Area and around the nation and the world. An extraordinary accomplishment. Thank you for that great APA symposium. <laughs> Finally, members of the class of 2015, along with the class of 2016, reminded us about the importance of taking into account the role of power and privilege in public policy. Thank you for that. Why is it important to study power and privilege in public policy? Why should we care about it? In fact, this leads us to the age-old question, what is public policy? Indeed, family members have probably asked you, why not get a degree that everyone knows about? <laughs> why not get a degree in business or in law or something else? The answer to these questions is that public policy goes beyond asking how to make a profit or how to write a law. It asks these deeper questions. How can governments devise rules that make the private sector work eff effectively and efficiently to achieve good ends and not just to make profits? How can governments write laws that are fair and just? How can governments and nonprofits solve the hard problems that the private sector can't solve. Pollution, poverty, public health, providing defense, ensuring safe communities, and many other problems. Business degrees and law degrees do not provide the skills to answer these questions. They take the current distribution of power and privilege as fixed. But public policy schools do ask these questions and they do not take the status quo as fixed. We do this at public policy schools by providing our graduates with two things. First, our graduates get the tools to obtain and produce 
the best possible information and evidence about making public programs work better. Second, they learn about ways to find out about the needs and concerns of the communities affected by public programs. Both of these are extraordinarily important. Let me explain why. First, we believe in getting the best possible evidence about what works, in getting at the truth as much as possible, because we do not want to be like ideologues of the left or the right or the center, who merely provide rhetorical flourish and rhetorical solutions. We want to get at the truth because we do not want to deny the evidence. We do not want to deny the evidence that shows that racial profiling is a bad way to undertake policing. Food stamps can pay big dividends in adulthood for children who have access to them. Climate change is real and it is man-made and under our control if we limit emissions of CO2. And so on with many other topics. The truth is a powerful weapon and it's a weapon especially important for those who do not have power and privilege because the truth, at least I'd like to believe, ultimately does win out. We also believe that our graduates must take into account the needs of communities that he or she serves. We know that values and priorities must be developed in conjunction with everyone, especially the poor, the marginalized, and those who lack wealth and power. Our students reminded of this, of this during the past year, and we thank you for that. I am especially pleased because about 15 years ago, I wrote an article in the American Prospect with two co-authors entitled, The Big Tilt. We warned about the pernicious impact of money in politics. We said then, the increasing role of contributions as a form of political activity, which goes hand in hand with rapidly rising campaign costs, has profound implications for political equality. When money replaces time as the principal form of political currency, the playing field is no longer level. The number of people who can be effective players is diminished. The range of issues articulated is narrowed. Those who are especially active in politics do not necessarily represent the priorities or the views of those who are more quiescent. And when those who are disadvantaged by virtue of low levels of education or income do participate, they express distinctive concerns, needs, and opinions. So, so long as inequalities in education and income and in other ways persist, so long as Americans have unequal opportunities to develop and practice civic skills, and so long as citizens increasingly donate money rather than time to politics, Politics and policy will be tilted, in the big tilt, toward the voices, voices of those with money and with education, and the American ideal of an equal political voice for all will be thwarted. America will not be the land of political equality and economic opportunity for all. The class of 2015 knows these things, and I thank them for reminding us of them and for urging us to say more about them in our courses, in our curriculum. We are on our way to doing that. As the class of 2015 goes back into the world, I look forward to their achieving great things. And one thing I know they will work on, I know you will work on, is leveling the playing field and trying to overcome the big tilt that is developed in America where those with wealth have disproportionate voice and power. More than ever, nothing could be more important than to have dedicated, committed, and immensely talented individuals who want to solve the world's problems. I know that you are those individuals. Armed now with more evidence, I hope, more skills to get evidence, more ability to find the truth, and more ways to think about diverse communities. I will watch your progress with great anticipation. And I know I will surely be awestruck by all your accomplishments. Congratulations 
to you all. Let me end with one final thought. Let's thank all of the families, spouses, partners, children, and friends who have supported us during our time, during your time as graduate students here at GSPP. Let us thank all of those people who asked, what is a public policy degree anyway? <laughs> Let's thank them for their support. So congratulations and good luck, class of 2015. It's been a thrill to have you here. As always, we've learned as much from you, probably more, than you've learned from us. But thank you for being here. I hope we've made you better at developing evidence and finding the truth, and also better at dealing with the diverse communities that you're going to go out into. And I hope we'll make you, we have helped make you, the best public policy graduates you can possibly be. Thank you. So now let me call the next speaker to the podium. Uh, it's Mark Hoffman, Master of Public Policy from 1975, and he's chair of the GSPP Alumni Association Board of Directors, uh, which produces a lot of help for us and uh, helps us think through a lot of important problems. Mark, please come up. Thank you, Henry. I, uh, class of 1975, and I got up here all on my own. It's amazing. <laughs> As the Dean said, I currently serve as chair of the GSPP Alumni Association Board of Directors, and congratulations to each of you on completing your public policy degree. On behalf of the GSPP alumni community, I officially welcome you, as of today, to our alumni association. You were all students for two years. Most of you will be alumni for 40, 50, 60 years. It's a label you can't reject. <laughs> As an alumnus of UC Berkeley and of the Goldman School, I'm confident that each of you will be a positive force in whatever career you choose. Today, you're joining a community of more than 2,000 GSPP alumni dedicated to making the world a better place and certainly the dean highlighted a number of ways that's being done. Alumni who are committing, committed to supporting GSPP, its faculty, staff, and most importantly, its students and fellow alumni. As our newest members of the GSPP Alumni Association, there are a variety of ways in which you can give back to the school. This includes volunteering your time to help current and prospective students, providing opportunities and connections for student internships, for IPAs and APAs, and most importantly, for employment. Giving back financially, which you have already started by your gift to the school. These are some of the many ways in which you can give back to GSPP and the Alumni Association Board looks forward to working with you on these endeavors. Hopefully, some of you will choose to run for our Board of Directors and help lead the association as we go forward. Again, on behalf of your Alumni Association and its Board of Directors, welcome and congratulations, Class of 2015. And now, it is my pleasure to welcome Brittany Carter and Nicholas Alexander to the podium.
Good morning. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, distinguished faculty, Sir William, you will never be forgotten pay. <laughs> Family, significant others, insignificant others, <laughs> friends, and my fellow graduates, class of 2015, we made it. It was not easy to get to this moment. Let's pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> now please join me in thanking those people at GSPP who helped us get here, the wonderful faculty and staff. And now let's thank the truly indispensable, the angel investors, those who believed in us, gave us their time and money before our success was at all obvious. Our family and friends and loved ones. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fellow graduates, we face incredible challenges ahead. Just looking at the past few months of 2015, it's already been a tumultuous year from the earthquakes in Nepal, to the Ebola outbreak in Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, to riots in Baltimore. There are hundreds of people working to repair the damage, working to heal the wounds and to move forward, but there are many obstacles and progress can be slow. The sluggish pace of progress encumbers many of the policy areas we seek to influence, and this can be frustrating for ambitious graduates of the Goldman School of Public Policy who are used to success after success, victory after victory. Normally, I try to stay level-headed in spite of my frustration with the pace of change, but today I would like to communicate my true feelings about incremental change with the assistance of Ms. Brittany Carter, who will serve as my anger translator. Thank you, Abney. <laughs> Actually, Ms. Ms. Carter and I don't want to talk about our frustrations. <laughs> it has to be inspirational, right? We want to talk about a, uh, our contributions to a brighter, more peaceful, more just society and world. We have very lofty goals for the class of 2015. We are graduating from one of the top graduate programs at one of the most competitive universities in the world. And in a few moments, we will walk across this stage and receive an official document from the state of California that bestows upon us, quote, a degree of Master of Public Policy with all the rights and privileges thereto pertaining. Among other things, this degree certifies us to employ the Oaxaca blinder decomposition to examine explained and unexplained differences in outcome variables, to draw an Edgeworth box and locate within it points of Pareto optimality, and also to solve social problems in eight sometimes difficult to execute but easy to remember steps. We are undoubtedly masters of public policy. <laughs> But I want to suggest something radical, especially in this moment when so many of us are deciding what next steps we will take professionally and vying for the favor of potential employers. I want to suggest that the worth of our contributions, both present and future, cannot possibly be measured by earning the favor of our colleagues in academia, in glossy conference rooms, or in the marbled elegance of government buildings. I want to suggest that now is the time that we put our school motto to the test, that our first responsibility with this degree in hand is to speak truth to power. I can also say from earned experience, <laughs> yeah. 
I can also say from earned experience that this is not easy. The truth is often uncomfortable. Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie recently gave a speech in New York expressing her worry that the, the desire to be comfortable has brought, quote, dangerous silencing into American public conversation. She said, I have often been told that I cannot speak on certain issues because I am young and female, or to use the disparaging Nigerian speak, because I am a small girl. She continued, the fear of causing offense, the fear of ruffling the careful layers of comfort becomes a fetish. The result of this is that in many public conversations, we place our highest values not in truth, but in comfort. We contend that the choice to engage in public policy is to reject comfort in favor of truth. This is both an external and internal process. Now that we share the kind of authority gained through this highly respected degree, our challenge will be to confront our own privilege and ask ourselves whose truths we are speaking. We must. <laughs> we must learn to create sp space and public discourse for voices that have been silenced or marginalized and to find truth amidst the noise. Thank you, Sean Tanner. <laughs> Let me give you an example. The setting is the 2013 United Nations Conference in Warsaw in response to climate change. The major question at hand was, should developing nations who bear the brunt of harm caused by droughts, by floods, uh, rising sea levels, be compensated by wealthier nations who are responsible for the majority of carbon emissions? These developing nations proposed a metric uh, for the responsibility of global warming by looking at historic emissions. Stay with me. <laughs> when wealthy nations refused, an alliance of 133 countries walked out in protest forcing the body to reevaluate the premise of the conversations. The truth is that wealthy nations do acknowledge their greater contributions to global warming and their responsibility to mitigate it. The principle of common but differentiated responsibilities is enshrined in multiple international treaties. The more uncomfortable truth is that the voices of poor nations are being marginalized, as are the lives of people living on Pacific islands that may soon be annihilated. Whether we examine international, federal, state, or local government policy, it is important that we continue to ask ourselves who the governing body is meant to serve. Who belongs at the table? As the University of California, Berkeley law professor and scholar John A. Powell says, belonging is the most important good we distribute in society as it is prior to and informs all other distributive decisions. Belonging means more than being accepted as fully human and having access. It means having a meaningful voice and the opportunity to participate in the design of social and cultural structures. By challenging our comfort fetish, we can find new ways to collaborate, new ways to overcome collective action failure and chip away at the persistent public policies that we confront today. The idea that we can seek wisdom from people who have been oppressed to make more equitable societal structures is what legal scholar Mari Matsuda calls looking to the bottom. She writes, those on the bottom who speak out against the odds for their vision of justice often become powerful people in the popular mind. The critical scholar can invoke Sojourner Truth as she silenced a hostile crowd with the power of her slave experience. Cesar Chavez as he fasted for the forgotten farm workers. And Menor Yasui, who like Homer Plessy before him, orchestrated his own arrest to bring attention to discriminatory curfews in, imposed on Japanese Americans. These are the voices that become lost in a setting that values comfort over truth. So we hope, in addition to continuing the scholarly study of ethics and the distribution of scarce resources and causality, 
that we also commit to looking to the bottom. What voices can we help emerge? What alliances can we form? What discomfort can we stir? And as a result of that, what new truths can we speak to power? <laughs> As we said before, this is no easy task, but we are confident that the class of 2015 is abundantly prepared. <laughs> I mean, just look at those wonderful faces. That's great. Good faces. So class of 2015, congratulations on your achievement thus far. Now, as we forge ahead, armed with an arsenal of quantitative policy tools, a diploma certifying our expertise, let's dare to look to the bottom for truth affirm those truths even when uncomfortable, continue to challenge ourselves in spite of the slow pace of change, and never forget those who helped us to reach our full potential. Thank you. like to call Professor Hillary Hoynes to the podium, who was selected by our classmates as this year's faculty speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! That was fantastic. Thank you very much, Nicholas and Brittany, for that inspiring and incredible speech. That is a tough act to follow. Let's give them another round of applause. Thanks a lot. My name is Hilary Hoynes. Uh, I'm an economist and professor here in the School of Public Policy. It is my great honor to be part of this faculty and to be here and to be asked to give remarks by this incredible group of students. I want to just offer my uh, welcome to the family, friends, who are here to support this incredible group of graduating 2015 MPP students from the Goldman School. I am not one who's usually short for words, nor do I find much struggle in getting up in front of a group, but this is different. And in preparing my remarks, I, I sort of came to the realization that I've been here as long as you have. Um, while I've been doing this, I've been around the block for a while. Uh, I've been, had the great fortune to be a professor and teacher for 25 years almost. Um, but this is only my second year at the Goldman School, so I really am honored that you asked me to speak and I found myself thinking, do I even know the Goldman School? Do I know what public policy is? Um, <laughs> But I did come to the realization that I think I know who you are. Um, so in this process of reflection and thinking about my thoughts today, I wanted to think about these past two years and what I've learned about the Goldman School and more importantly, what I've learned about the MPP student body as we've both been here for these two years. So I came up with five words that I think best describe what I've learned about you in the process of our time together. And so I'm going to talk about those five words. The first word is passion. In thinking about who comes to the Goldman School, and if I had one word to describe what seems to be a characteristic that embodies every Goldman School student that I've had the good <laughs> fortune to know, it would be passion passion about their policy area of interest, be it immigration, global poverty, education, criminal justice, and many other areas of interest among this class. And making a commitment to making a difference, as is incredibly exemplified by the remarks of Nicholas and Brittany. So passion is the first. The second word I came up with is knowledge. And I've been thinking a bit lately about the difference between intelligence 
which this group surely has, and could easily be a word that I had chosen among my five, and knowledge. And as a bit of a sidebar, since it's the only time in my life I might have the opportunity to say it, uh, let me tell you about a story from my meeting this spring with President Obama. <laughs> so I had the great fortune to be brought to the White House. This was just an opportunity to tell you the story, really. I had to work it in somehow. So I'm wrapping around knowledge. <laughs> so I had the great fortune to be a invited to speak to the president and vice president and a few of his top aides about issues of poverty and inequality. And I was one of six economists that was brought to the Roosevelt Room to have this conversation. And I was nervous like today. It was a similar kind of nervousness, a different kind of experience than I typically have. Once the president got in the room, um, he started speaking. And it was clear that President Obama has a great deal of intelligence. And I was impressed by that. And, and it was awesome to see that. And you know that right away when you start engaging with someone. But as the conversation went on, and he was asking our um, counsel about these incredibly important issues of the day, what impressed me more was that he had knowledge. And with that knowledge, we got down into the weeds of economic issues, uh, current policy. And the thing about knowledge is you have to work for that. You have to work for that through reading and experience. And what really impressed me was that he had that knowledge. And I see the same features in the MPP student body. You're clearly very intelligent, and that is awesome but you also have knowledge, and you have to work at that knowledge, and you have to gain experience for that knowledge. And every day that I had the great fortune to be teaching an elective this spring, I was asking you about your knowledge on issues of the social safety net because of what you brought to the table that complemented what I knew. So my second word is knowledge. To lighten things up a bit, my third word is talent. So lest we be too high-minded here, I want to acknowledge the fact that many things go on outside the school uh, that also make up this incredible student body. So I unfortunately had to miss the GSPP talent show this year. I was out of town visiting my mother. So I, I had a good reason to be away. Uh, but I caught what I could on YouTube, and I urge family and friends out there to do the same. This is an extremely talented bunch of students beyond Edgeworth boxes and causation. Uh, singing, dancing, singer, songwriter, jokes, the whole variety show range. So the takeaway is that the talents of our students are not limited to the eightfold path and policy analysis. Word number four, involvement. In my 25 years of university life, I have never been anywhere where there is so much going on. In addition to classwork, which the students obviously take, in addition to their capstone projects, the IPA in the first year and the APA in the second year, in addition to the teaching and research jobs that they have on campus, one might not think that there's time for much more, but among these students, there is. I consulted with Martha Chavez, and I asked, how many student groups are there at GSPP? Because it seems like there's a lot of things going on. And she dutifully sent me the list of the 28 student groups that are active at the Goldman School of Public Policy, to name a few, Art, Culture, and Public Policy, the Policy Matters Journal, published by our students, and the only journal of its kind in the entire United States. Woo! <laughs> as well as policy groups in criminal justice, environment, health policy, politics, inequality, conflict, and security, and so on. And uh, Dean Brady uh, gave some great examples of some of the incredible um, 
uh, types of events that these groups have sponsored, including the Race Symposium uh, and many others. So there's an incredible amount of things going on among, can I remind you, the 200 students at this school and the amount of activities going on illustrates how involved this group is. So my fourth word is involvement. And my last word is activism. So beyond involvement is, is activism. And two prominent examples of activism just from the last few months here in the spring of 2015 is the Power and Privilege Report, uh, which we've, we've already heard something about today. And I want to just call out what was so incredible about this experience is seeing the class of 2015 and 2016 pushing for change right here in their own backyard uh, at the Goldman School of Public Policy, urging us as faculty to consider changes to our curriculum, the kinds of visitors we bring to campus, outreach, and recruitment. So, Family and friends, I, I urge you to ask your students about this uh, when you have more time with them. A second example is the Coalition of Women Spammers, or fondly known as cows. We were treated to a week this spring of amazing stories highlighting women in policy. And I want to uh, read you their, their motto, uh, which is, quote, too often women's voices are unheard underrepresented or considered irrelevant in the policy sphere. Can we hear some women's voices now? So I said five words, but I need to throw in one more. It's not a word, it's a phrase. You guys are just all around really good people. So it is my honor to have you be the first class that I had the great honor to get to know here at the Goldman School. So let me leave you with, with one parting thought because a very wise person, Dan Ackland, told me <laughs> that all graduation speeches need to contain some career advice. So I'm gonna leave you with a bit of career advice. So in the past year, this perhaps might be just another example of how to bring this into my speech. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a career award this year for mentoring in my um, field of economics, and in particular of mentoring women in the economics profession. And I realized I do care a lot about mentoring young people in my profession, and I was thinking about what let me, led me to that point, and I want to end with some thoughts about that. So I realized when I was a young professional, I'm sure this is not true of many of you, but it might be true of some of you, it was certainly true of me. I didn't know very much. And more importantly, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so when I sort of moved to being slightly more experienced, I thought that I could help others, but I probably could best describe my approach as just being there. That is, when people ask questions, I can help. And as a woman in my field, which is a very minority representation of women, just being there and being some kind of role model might help. But I've come to believe that that's just not enough. And I've realized that I've learned how to navigate the professional life that I engage in, um, in my field of academia, and how to be successful and what to look out for. And I think we forget what we know and the fact that not everybody even knows what they're supposed to know. And so I myself have moved from just be there to reach out, find mentees, and tell them what they, sh they need to know. And as my husband tells me all the time, I overshare. And perhaps some of my MPP students know that as well. And so my message to you is find a mentor, be a mentor, and share your knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. So it was my great honor to introduce the next speaker, Corey Matthews, GSPP Class of 2015, who will present the Class of 2015 gift to GSPP. Thank you so much. 
<laughs> Good morning, Good morning. family, friends, loved ones. Greetings to the faculty, staff, and my fellow classmates, soon to be graduates. It's good to be here. I'm Corey Matthews, a member of the class of 2015, and I had the distinct pleasure of serving as the class representative along with Michael Burdick for these past two years. Mike and I have been entrusted with the opportunity to represent the diverse interests and needs of our classmates, and believe me, this bunch will certainly keep you busy. The thing about the class of 2015 that struck me initially was its commitment to community and the richness that came with knowing about one another, our various interests, our goals, our ambitions. Really from the very first day of school when we met at math boot camp, <laughs> along with the countless hours of studying and group projects and all the various activities that would describe our adventurous first and second years. With a schedule that's actually more like that of grade school, for those that do not know our family and friends, we meet each day, yes, Monday through Friday, at about 8.30 in the morning in the same room uh, for the entire first year. <laughs> you just can't help but learn about everyone's stories and how they got to the Goldman School of Public Policy, the key influential events that shaped their trajectories and led them here to be here with one another. I'd say that GSPP, with its intentionality around cohort building, its active student organizations, its special presentations, its guest speakers, its economics, its quant, and all these things, the list goes on and on. It strives each year to create a cohort of students who can take advantage of all those things that the program has to offer. The class of 2015 did just that and more. As Dean Brady and Professor Hillary Hoynes alluded to earlier, this class is one of first, very many firsts, the first to host the Staff Appreciation Day, the first to not only have the Policy Matters Journal, but take that a little bit further and create a blog where everybody can kind of blog day in and day out, the first to host an APA symposium, just to name a few of the type of things that our class engages its interest in. Our classmates can be described as visionary, purposeful, passionate, because they really are committed to what they care about. But they're also practical and helpful. They're willing to roll up their sleeves to help to get things done. They are truly agents of change. In coming together to reach consensus around our class gift, we decided that we wanted to find a way to further support Goldman's commitment to an intellectually vibrant and diverse scholarly community. For it is this same commitment that has benefited all of us and shaped our experience. So it gives me great pleasure to announce that the class of 2015 has met its goal of raising $10,000 to support the new community fund. Our campaign, the Love 15 campaign, is thankful for everyone's support and contribution. You can still make contributions, everyone out there. <laughs> and Michael and I would like to especially thank the committee members for their innovation and their leadership. They know who they are, thank you. We're very excited to give in order to support our school. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, all right, thanks Dean. It now gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Bob Reich, who will present the first Outstanding Graduate Student Instructor Award. Right. For you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, outside the hallowed halls of the University of California at Berkeley, uh, the acronym GSI may mean gastrointestinal infection. It could mean a lot of things. But we mean it to stand for graduate student instructor. And even, even that kind of demeans or understates the value of these people who are our colleagues in teaching. Uh, they really, the GSIs really should stand for great, special, incredible people. <laughs> 
Uh, and it gives me a great, great pleasure to give an award. And, and by the way, I don't know exactly how these awards, I think these awards, it could go to so many of you who helped us over the last couple of years. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what and how the selection was made, but I'm so delighted to say that the, the first one uh, is somebody who I have had the pleasure uh, of working with over the last couple of years. And I'm going to state his name. I'd like him to come up and accept the award, and then I'm going to embarrass him a little bit. <laughs> and his name is Nicholas Alexander. <laughs> and Nick, you know, you know how I can embarrass you. Yes, I you do. know that. <laughs> well, there's an award here someplace. Wait a minute. Put up your hand like that. Uh, now, Nick, I, I'm going to embarrass you by just reading a couple of the things that students have said about you. Nicholas Alexander taught my spring 2013 wealth and poverty section, and it is by far the most cherished discussion section I have had at Berkeley. Robert Reich is so lucky to have such a competent graduate student working with him. Thank you, student. Here's another one. Nick was by far the best GSI I have had at UC Berkeley. He continued to show unwavering support for every student in my discussion section and constantly went out of his way to make sure I was successful. When I couldn't make it to his physical office hours, he scheduled a Skype session. <laughs> Nicholas Alexander has been the best GSI I have ever had at Berkeley. He constantly came prepared to teach the class and motivated us to learn the material. <laughs> I took Wealth and Poverty last spring 2014 with Nick Alexander and had one of the most positive experiences I have ever had in a discussion section during my time at Cal. And the final one, I love Nick Alexander. <laughs> And now, my stolid Professor Steve Raphael. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I've been teaching microeconomic theory at the Goldman School now for, for quite some time, I think almost 15, 16 years. And I have to say, it's, it's one of the hardest courses the, the students have to take. It's the full first year. We meet every morning at 8 o'clock, 8.30. Um, office hours are full, a lot of student contact hours, people coming every week, wanting help with problem sets, trying to understand the mouth. Sometimes people cry. In fact, people, people cry quite often. And for some reason this year, you know, was the third, you know, the first week nobody shows up to office hours, the second week no one shows up, third week I'm like looking in the hallway, you know. And the fourth week I decide I'm going to go into the living room and try to drum up some business. And what do I see but 40 students crowded around a whiteboard covered in, uh, in equations surrounding my GSIs, Andy Holkren and Dan Baker. And it just turns out they like them more. You know, it was better than me. So it, it, is, it is my great pleasure to, to award the Graduate Student Instructor Award to Andy Holkren this year who is graduating with this class. So Andy, would you please come up? So, but don't go away yet. So, uh, I just want to want to note that that Andy, the the very talented instructor and scholar that he is, is going to continue with us, and he's going to be earning his PhD at ARE starting this fall. Yeah. 
And I'm glad that I already have tenure. I don't have to compete with him. So, okay. <laughs> And now we'll have the presentation of the Smolensky Award for the best uh, APA. I'm Hector Cardenas, and I led one of the APA sections this year. A fundamental part of, grad of the Graduate School of Public Policy's mission, as we've heard today, is to train a cadre of young professionals in the methods, techniques, and ethical underpinnings of public policy analysis. Ours is a practical discipline that strives above all else to better the world by providing real world solutions to the problems that we face in the public square. To be complete, the education in which you have participated requires a capstone a policy analysis for a real client facing a real problem or opportunity. The advanced policy analysis, or as we like to call it a GSPP APA, is precisely such a capstone that allows our students to deploy the many resources that they have learned, plus their passion, plus their interest, plus their activism, to the analysis of a real problem. The identification of evidence of possible alternatives for a solution, and the crafting of feasible and implementable recommendations that their client can act upon. Back in 1998, the school created the Smolensky Prize, named to honor our Dean Emeritus, Gino Smolensky, a prize to recognize the best APA in each graduating class. Faculty from each APA section nominates one APA project from their section to be considered for the prize. Then a committee of faculty who are not teaching APA review all nominated projects and select a winning project. This year, Professor Jane Malden, Professor Sarah Anzia, and GSPP alum Frank Neuhauser, MPP 1993, led the committee. The faculty nominated the following graduates for consideration for the Smolensky Prize. Sean Brick. <laughs> Marina Fisher. <laughs> Anne Hollingshead. <laughs> Andy Haltgren. Alex Marchese. <laughs> Lucy McKenzie. <laughs> and Jin No. <laughs> I am pleased to announce that this year's winner of the Smolensky Prize for Outstanding Advanced Policy Analysis is Marina Fisher. <laughs> Marina, please come up to the stage. <laughs> Marina's APA title is Improving Service to Those Who Served, Recommendations for Delivering High Quality Care in California Veterans Homes which she developed for the State of California's Assembly Budget Committee. In her APA, Marina developed a roadmap for California to improve the care it delivers to veterans at its eight nursing homes, many years after they served their country, often at great personal sacrifice. Through careful analysis that combined the review, classification, and tabulation of administrative data, a lot of it, with site visits to veterans' homes and interviews with administrators and staff, Marina was able to piece together a disturbing picture of a system of care 
that is more expensive than comparable systems in other states, yet delivers substandard care. She then developed a novel framework for understanding the roots of the problem, an indicator system for assessing progress, and specific actionable recommendations both for her client, the California State Assembly Budget Committee, and for the agency that runs the veterans' homes, CalVet. Marina's paper is beautifully crafted and written. It is carefully presented and articulated with great clarity. It uses a variety of data types and sources, features a novel conceptual framework, and balances short-term and long-term options. Most importantly, and I really want to emphasize this because it is at the core of our mission and our education here, her report is useful to her client. <laughs> I am confident that Marina's APA will help the California Budget Assembly and CalVet to improve the quality of life of vulnerable California veterans at the sunset of their lives. Congratulations, Marina. There you go, we should smile. I was in Sac uh, Sacramento this fall, and the person who is uh, in charge of uh, Marina's uh, APA project asked me, well, is this a good person I'm getting? I said, I think you're getting the very best, which I would have said about anybody. I want you to know that. But <laughs> it turns out I was absolutely right. <laughs> so that's great. That's really thrilling. Our commencement speaker today is Fred Blackwell, Chief Executive Officer of the San Francisco Foundation. Since 1948, the San Francisco Foundation has brought together networks of philanthropists uh, throughout the Bay Area uh, to try to make the Bay Area the best place it can be. It ranks among the nation's largest community foundations in grant making and assets. Former Oakland Mayor Jean Kwan described Mr. Blackwell as a brilliant, dedicated, get-it-done leader. He is an Oakland native with a long-standing career in the Bay Area and the nation. Prior to joining the foundation, he served as interim city administrator for the city of Oakland, where he had previously served as the assistant city administrator, so he knows city government. He was executive director of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency and director of the mayor's office of community development in San Francisco. He served as the director of the Making Connections Initiative for the Annie Casey Foundation in the Lower San Antonio neighborhood of Oakland, so he knows the nonprofit philanthropic world as well. He holds a master's degree in city planning from UC Berkeley and a bachelor's degree in urban studies from Morehouse College. It's my great pleasure to welcome Fred Blackwell as our commencement speaker. Thank you, Thank you for coming. Pleasure to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, to the dean, uh, to the faculty, uh, distinguished guests, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank everybody for the uh, invitation to be here with the graduates this morning. Um, I'm going to try to be uh, brief. One of the things that you will uh, actually learn uh, over the course of your career is to be wary of anybody who says they're going to be brief. Um, but I, I'm also kind of self-aware. I've been through a lot of leadership programs, and they talk a lot about self-awareness, and I, I see myself as the last speaker and the person who's standing in between uh, the degrees, so I will actually adhere to the brief thing. <laughs> um, the first thing that I want to do, though, is I want to speak to the people in the back of the room, uh, to uh, the parents, the grandparents, the aunts and uncles, the friends, the loved ones who have provided support to the people who are graduating today. Um, Thank you uh, and congratulations to you. Uh, I have a little bit of a story I want to say about this. Um, you know, I actually grew up in Oakland, uh, and aside from the time that I went to the school that was founded and run by the Black Panther Party, I went to public schools in Oakland. And so I graduated from Skyline High School. Uh, and high school, uh, for me, I did well in college and graduate school, but high school was not the, a place where I really excelled. I was a little bit of a rockhead. Um, and, 
You know, I remember uh, something about that graduation. I'll, I'll actually never forget it. Uh, it was on the football field where the graduation was, and as I was walking off of the uh, podium with my degree, I see my mom coming out of the stands, walking up to the 50-yard line, and she actually snatched the diploma out of my hand. <laughs> and she snatched it out of my hand and told me that it was hers, that she had earned that diploma and I didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so I just want to give a hand to the people. I know that these folks up here I know that these folks didn't put you all through that, but I, I just want to know, in case they did, that I understand the work that you put in to making sure that they got here today. Um, to the graduates, uh, I just want to say congratulations to you. Uh, you all have hit a very important milestone. You not only uh, have turned the page for the last two years of work uh, with this esteemed faculty to uh, get to where you wanted to go, but you are also uh, turning the page on a career uh, that I think will be very rewarding uh, and it will pay big dividends not only for you, uh, but to the community as a whole. And for that, I say uh, congratulations, and I say in advance, thank you for the things that you are about to do. Um, but I, I do want to say a couple of things. And, you know, as I sit here uh, as the commencement speaker uh, for the graduate school that I understand is number one in the country in public policy. <laughs> You know, there are a few ways that you can approach the speech. You know, you can give the speech that is, you know, the world is your oyster, go forth and do all the stuff that you're supposed to do. Um, this is not that speech. <laughs> um, you can also give the speech that says, you know, put out your high goals uh, and do what you can to reach those goals and nothing can stand in the way. This is not that speech either. <laughs> this speech, uh, you know, and I'm gonna apologize a little bit in advance for this, this is more of a challenging speech. Uh, because I think we live in challenging times. Uh, whether it is uh, the growing concerns about uh, income and wealth inequality, or it is the uh, unrest uh, in many of the uh, cities in this country uh, that revolve around pl police brutality, or it's the unrest that kind of moves, pivots from uh, police brutality into concerns uh, about economic opportunity, uh, we are at a serious crossroads. Uh, and what I wanted to talk to you about today is what I think those challenges are, uh, what I think the world is that you're walking into in your careers looks like. Um, give you a little bit of uh, my two cents around what I think um, uh, policy leaders of today uh, need to be thinking about and give you a little bit of an example of what it may look like. Uh, and so that's really what I want to do. Um, and I want to start with race. Um, recently, uh, we at the San Francisco Foundation uh, commissioned a report uh, with a group called Policy Link um, and a group called the Program for uh, Environmental uh, and Regional Equity. I guess I'm allowed to say this as a USC. Uh, um, and we asked them to do an equity profile for the Bay Area for us. And I want to share what some of that was. Um, it started with an analysis of the demographics. Uh, and what it said was that by 2042, we will be a nation that's majority people of color. Uh, that the state is ahead of the nation uh, and that the Bay Area is already there. In fact, uh, in looking at the Bay Area compared to uh, the top 150 uh, regions in the country, uh, it was number two in terms of diversity. But what it also showed us was that of those 150 regions, uh, what was first, uh, in, I think in 1979, we were ranked uh, 45 in income inequality. Um, today we are ranked 14, uh, which means we are going towards more income inequality. Uh, and the other thing that it highlighted in this regard is that we are uh, in the Bay Area, a group of high achievers, and so we were well on our way to number one. Um, but what it also showed was that when you think about readiness, in relationship to diversity and the changing demographics in the country, in the state, and in the region, uh, we're in trouble. Uh, that when you look at uh, income and wealth uh, concentration, uh, when you look at the gaps in educational achievement uh, and attainment, uh, and even when you look at things like health outcomes, uh, the very people who are moving towards a majority are the same people who are currently being left behind. 
and that in fact, from a health perspective, um, just around the way in Oakland, a young person who's born in the hills today uh, is likely to live 12 to 15 years shorter uh, than that same person born in the flat hills in East Oakland. Uh, and, and even when you would control for education, which is supposed to be the great equalizer, uh, what you find is that uh, Latino individuals and African American individuals earn significantly less than their white counterparts. The, the punchline, though, for the report was really interesting to me. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that you can define and look at the, the, the results or uh, the, the, the implications of inequality and inequity. Uh, and the way they looked at it was they looked at uh, what it would look like in gross domestic product in the Bay Area if we had just closed the wage gap between uh, the people of color and their white colleagues. And what it showed was that there would be $117 billion more circulating in the Bay Area economy if we had a more equitable frame around how we were approaching the work. But it's not just about race, it's also about class and economic status. Uh, and I always hesitate to do this, uh, but I want to, because whenever you do this, uh, whenever you quote somebody uh, who's actually in the audience who's done the work, you always get it wrong. <laughs> um, but Robert Reich is among the people who have really put out there the fact that uh, income inequality uh, is not only kind of a threat to the middle class, but it's a threat to our economy. Um, and then others like, uh, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but uh, Our Kids, written by Robert Putnam, I guess I can say Harvard too. Uh, here, um, also talked about uh, economics and, and income and economic status as it relates to economic mobility. Uh, and he showed a really dynamic thing, which is if you look at income on one side of the axis and you look at just name the issue on the other side of the axis, whether it's dropout rates or it's uh, graduation rates or it's incarceration rates, and you take one line uh, that is the line of folks who have really high incomes, uh, really uh, middle class, upper middle class, and you take another line that represents folks who are low income, what you get is the scissor analysis, which is whatever you look at, the scissor analysis, this line is growing farther and farther apart from this line. So whether you're talking about school performance or you're talking about um, incarceration rates, Low-income folks are faring worse and worse. Sometimes they're doing better over time. Um, but they're doing worse and worse in relationship to folks who have that income. And it just goes like this all the way around. So it's not just about race, it's about economic status. And not only is it about those two things, uh, in Baltimore, one of the things that was really interesting is that the real uh, crux of the, uh, the initial, initial kind of uprising was about police brutality. But when you listen to the young people that were in Baltimore, what they really talked about is a feeling of lack of access to opportunity and a lack of hope uh, that led to the unrest. And so Baltimore, like many other cities, highlights the fact that place is also important uh, in terms of defining opportunity, also too important. So what I wanted to kind of convey in terms of where you are lead, where you're headed and what the world looks like that you're entering into is that for far too many people, your race, your economic status, and where you live is far too much of a determining factor of your ability to connect the opportunity and to really realize the American dream. That's the world. That's the world you're walking into. And as policy people, you know, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of different jobs and I've run across a lot of folks who have policy backgrounds. And so I kind of have a sense of where you're headed. Um, you guys are gonna be uh, working at the federal level, uh, in government, uh, at the state level, at the local level. You'll be working in a variety of departments. Some of you all will be in planning departments. Some of you will be working on economic development. Some of you guys will be working on uh, issues pertaining to health or child welfare. But you will all be either at or close to the front lines of these issues. Uh, and what it means is that not only do you need to be excellent at what you're doing and working within those institutions, but you will have a very strong responsibility to actually transform the very institutions that you will be working in. Uh, and the reason I want to highlight that uh, is because what this is really about is making sure that as you work on systems change, as you work on policy issues, yes, you should be grounded in the data, but you also have to be grounded in the best practices grounded in what people who you are seeking to serve are saying what they need, and those things have to be combined. 
Uh, and that is the way that you will be able to get to uh, the kinds of policies that you are looking for. But the importance of transforming those systems is very important as well. Uh, and it's important because whether it's at the federal level, the state level, or the local level, and whether it's well intended or not, many of the policies, many of the systems that we will be working in are the very systems and many of uh, the very policies that have created the very divides that I just talked about a little bit earlier. So it's not enough just to be able to work well with those systems. It's important to transform them. I want to talk a little bit, though, about one of the things that I think is an essential element in thinking about how you transform those systems. And that is this notion of targeting the most vulnerable. And I want to give you an example of this. Um, you know, but before I go there, I just want to say, you know, there's a, there are two ways that you can go about this. We can create systems that are universal systems and hope that the, most, the needs of the most vulnerable will be met. Or we can start with the most vulnerable and create systems that are responsive to them and therefore create systems that are responsive in meeting the needs of everyone. I think the most important example and the most, I think, visible one of those is curb cuts. Curb cuts were created uh, as a result of the advocacy for people who have mobile disabilities wanted to make sure that those people had access to our streets uh, and be able to move around the community in a way that was without stigma. But how many times have you seen curb cuts where the lawyer with the briefs that's carrying that briefcase is using the curb cuts? How many times have you seen the food preparation folks who are going to a catering event using the curb cuts? How many times have you seen the young mother with the baby carriage using the curb cuts? Curb cuts are the perfect example of how you seek to meet the needs of the most vulnerable among us, you meet the needs of everybody. And what I want to say about this is that very principle is what needs to be dealt with. That's the very principle that needs to be applied to the things that we are working on today. If you use the curb cuts principle, you will realize that when we create a criminal justice system that meets the needs and really understands that black lives matter, that when that happens, you will end up with a criminal justice system that treats everybody with dignity and respect. <laughs> the curb cut principle means that when you work on the education system, when you find a way to meet the needs of the kid in that classroom that is the most likely to fail, the most likely to drop out, that has the most challenges in their home and in their community, when you create the system in the school that's able to respond to that young person's needs, you will create a system in a school that will meet everybody's needs. So it's the curb cut principle, the principle that if you meet the needs of the most vulnerable in this society, we all benefit. It's the principle that I really wanted um, to emphasize with you today. I want to emphasize to you that you need to be, I want you to be the person to find that curb cut. Find the curb cuts in education. Find the curb cuts in the criminal justice system. Find the curb cuts in the public health system. Find those ideas where when you meet the needs of the most vulnerable, you meet the needs of all. I want to talk a little bit, though, about what this stuff looks like. Um, and you know, I've been you know, privileged to uh, do a lot of different things. Um, but I think one of the things that I've been most proud of was some of the work that I did in San Francisco. When I started at the Mayor's Office of uh, Community Development under uh, Mayor Newsom, Mayor Newsom had run on this platform, among many things, that was about making sure that city services and supports in San Francisco were being responsive to the, the most vulnerable children and families there. Um, and I was hired to kind of take that from soup to nuts. Uh, and the first thing that I did, and that we did as a group, because this was all done in a group, um, was we looked at the data. We looked at uh, child welfare data, we looked at children's mental health data, and we looked at juvenile probation data. And we put it on a map. And the map really confirmed what we already knew. That the kids and families that were struggling in San Francisco were not evenly distributed across the city. They were concentrated in very specific areas of the city. And as a matter of fact, half of the kids that had been removed from their homes, most of the kids that were in the juvenile justice system, most of the kids that were in the uh, children's mental health system live within walking distance of seven corners in San Francisco. Six of the seven corners were in front of public housing. The seventh corner was at the intersection of Jones and Eddy, heart of the Tenderloin. And so armed with that information, we began to work across public systems 
to come up with solutions. And we came to the conclusion that what we needed to do was saturate these seven corners with the kinds of services, supports, and connections that we thought would lead to better outcomes for kids and families. So we started with the data, uh, which I know you guys are all trained to do now. But the data wasn't enough. You know, what was interesting about these neighborhoods is two things. One was, uh, these were the neighborhoods that folks no longer were working in. Folks had kind of given up on these neighborhoods because it felt like the issues were just intractable. But the second thing that we learned when we showed up was not only was that the case, but these were also the same neighborhoods that when you show up to help, guess what? Folks aren't happy to see you. They aren't happy to see you because of all the promises that were made and not delivered before. And so when we engaged in conversations with the, the residents of these housing uh, developments, and that was my role too, one role was to work in the public systems, the other was to work at the neighborhood level with the residents, what they told us was that we couldn't have a conversation with them about services until we dealt with their housing conditions. And at the same time that we were having that conversation, uh, the Bush administration was in the process of gutting HUD uh, and also in the process of defunding the HOPE 6 program, which was really the most important financial tool for revitalizing public housing. But we decided that we were going to embark on the journey anyway to revitalize that public housing. Uh, and we did that in response to what we heard with the residents. And so the second key thing that I want to draw out of this story for you is it wasn't not enough for us to look at the data and look at the evidence. We had to put together a program that was responsive to what the folks who we were trying to serve were telling us about what needed to happen in their community. The next thing that happened is we started to work across systems uh, and we started to come across a, a variety of things that we thought were important. And what we ended up in was this kind of call and response relationship with the communities that we were trying to serve. We would put something out there, they would respond to it. They would put something out there, we would respond to it. And what we ended up with was a very ambitious program called Hope SF, uh, where we were going to rebuild the public housing in four areas that were doing the worst. But we were also going to simultaneously work on systems change to make sure that not only uh, were the families and kids that were in this public housing going to turn out better, uh, but that they were going to be the ones who were going to drive the system changes that were going to meet the needs of all in San Francisco. Where we are now is that um, we are halfway done with the first development where we have committed to no displacement. So all of the families that said they wanted to come back to that development came back. Um, we have also broken down on the second development, which, by the way, uh, was the recipient of a $40 million choice uh, award grant that was from the federal government from HUD as well. Um, I was the privilege to be uh, at the groundbreaking there, and it actually brought me to tears. Uh, it brought me to tears because I remembered that when I was first talking to those folks who lived in that public housing development and we told them when we were going to rebuild that public housing, I wasn't sure it was going to happen myself. Uh, but to be on that journey with them uh, and to see how proud and happy they were and looking forward to the things that were going to happen and how this was going to change their lives was a moving moment for me. We've also been able to raise a lot of money from the private sector around this, which brings me to the third piece of this, which is connections. I've been told over and over again that if you come up with a solution to problems as complex as the ones that I have laid out right now that only involves you and your institution, you need to go back to the drawing board because you're not thinking deeply or broadly enough about the issue. So partnering with the public sector, partnering with the private sector, these are issues that are multi-sector. These are issues that are working across parties. Uh, these are issues that work across uh, backgrounds as well as um, part ish, um, stakeholder groups. We have got to do this in partnership across the variety of folks who need it. Um, this is now one of the most studied programs uh, in the nation in terms of rebuilding public housing. And it really, I think, embodies a lot of the stuff that I heard a lot today about using the data, being evidence-based, connecting to the folks that you're trying to serve, being collaborative, and being multidisciplinary in the approach. And so I just wanted to lay that out there because I know sometimes you hear about the eight-step program, you think about these things, and you're not sure how it's going to work. It can work. Uh, and so the last thing I want to do is leave you with this. And, I, you know, I've left you with a lot of stuff. But if I, if I leave you with nothing else that you can remember, I want you to remember this. That there's a difference between a rock and a coffee bean. A difference between a rock and a coffee bean. If you put a rock in water, it may displace the water. There may be some ripples within the water. But ultimately, the water will remain the same, even when you take the rock out. 
But a coffee bean, when you put a coffee bean in water, it changes the water. It changes the color of the water. It changes the taste of the water. And even when you take the coffee bean out, the water will never be the same. What I want to ask you to be is be the coffee bean. Thank you. And now we will begin the presentation of the Master of Public Policy degrees. Kristen N. Abhold. <laughs> Ravi Agarwal. <laughs> Nicholas M. Alexander. Carla Nicole Argueta. <laughs> Connie Ballesteros. <laughs> Karina Bridget Bendersky. <laughs> Jessica Box. Sean Brick. Michael Burdick. Ignacio Rafael Camacho. Brittany Limar Carter. Lindsay Cattell. Sarah Madeline Chevalier. Molly Cohen Rosenthal. Mary Catherine Collins. Nicole Danielle Dana. Lucia Del Pupo. Francesca Delgado. Domacone. Wyatt Nicholas Donnelly Landolt. Barbara Egiguren. Miranda Everett. Kate Faust. Kate Fenimore. Mary June Gascon Flores. Daniela Garcia Santibanez Godoy. Aravind Reddy Gayam. (laughs) 
Laura Gerhardt. Rachel Katie Gold. David Calderon Gutierrez. Ethan Benjamin Guy. Hannah Maria Hamilton. Head. Andy Hultgren. Alex Kaplan. Leah D. Kessner. Laura Marie Herman Kramer. Tara Lewis. Shilu Becky Lee. Patrick Liao. Maura Lievano Nunez. <laughs> Alexander Xiaoro Rong Lin. <laughs> Hong Yu Lu. Mayor Harsha Melosaila Sarah Christine Camille Marks Corey Jarrell Matthews Lucy McKinsey. Mary Sophia Bombin McVeigh. Hannah E. Melnick. Catherine Marasek. Suzanne Merkelson. Jennifer Millman. Tatiana Moss. Akihiro Nakatani. Jin No. Femka Love Oldham. Felix Ya Ousu. William Pei. Jonathan Breck Peterson. <laughs> Catherine D. Rignes. <laughs> Katya E. Rodriguez. Hannah Royer. 
Alfonso Rojas Alvarez. Tara Nicole Rose. Mariana Nicole Sines. Tomokazu Saito. Anshuman Tawari. Carlos McGregor Villarreal. Perry Lee Weisberg. Jeremy Welsh Loveman. Justine Wallitzer. Philip Andy Wonder II. Bert Wyman. Jonathan William Vivian Yancey. Lana Zaman. Marina Fisher. This is so much fun, I think we should do it every year. It's great. Uh, first, I just want to thank this extraordinary faculty seated behind me for all their tremendous teaching. Uh, the tremendous research, uh, their commitment to solving social problems, and to their support for the school. So thank you to the faculty of the Goldman School. I am blessed with a fabulous, fabulous faculty, uh, the best in the country by far. Second, I want to thank Martha Chavez and Cecile and all of the Student Services Group which is simply fantastic. Uh, and they just do everything so well, uh, including their, their footprints uh, right here where I was supposed to stand. It, it gets down to that level of detail. And I mostly stood in the right place, mostly did the right things. I want to leave you with one final notion, which is uh, a few years back we went to Asia and we were talking to somebody who had been one of our ed executive programs. He was a doctor leading a hospital in Taiwan. And we, we're talking to him and we said, well, what did you get from our short executive program? And he said, what I got was courage. And then he recounted the tale about how the hospital that he runs in Taiwan has on its property the last place where lepers have a facility in Taiwan. And that there was a plan to build an extension of the mass transit system right through the leper colony and that he decided that that was wrong, that he could not let that happen, that this was the place where these people had had a life, uh, a very difficult life, and that he was gonna fight for them. And he did so. Now it turns out they're still building the extension, but the place where these lepers were is being preserved as much as possible. And so his lesson to me, and I hope a lesson that all of you have learned from the work you've already done and will learn, continue to relearn, is courage is so important. Try to do the hard thing. When you get those knots in your stomach about, gosh, this is gonna be hard, say to yourself, that's how I should be feeling. Though it's what I should be overcoming, I should because I'm lucky enough to have a Goldman School degree, to have all the opportunities you've had, I have to show courage I have to demonstrate that I can solve problems and get things done. So I'm sure, looking at this class, that you will show courage. But let me just encourage you to show that every point in your careers. Do the hard things, take on the hard challenges, and make sure that you actually really do change the world. So congratulations, class of 2015.
And I have one final responsibility. This is about the, the extent of the power of a dean. This is the moment where I show my incredible power. Graduates, please stand. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the President of the University of California and the Regents of the University of California, I take those pieces of paper and I turn them into your Master of Public Policy degree from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Congratulations.